Two points to make before we get started on this video on Westworld and the law. First is that there will be spoilers ahead as I record this. Um, season 2 episode 7 hasn't aired yet, so if you're not caught up then I would suggest catching up and then coming back and watching this video. Secondly, this is meant to be quite fun. I've taken a lot of guessing and estimates at various figures throughout this, so if I'm a little bit off then don't shout at me, but uh, any constructive discussion in the comments is more than welcome. Right, let's get started. So the first caveat to mention is that we're going to be analysing Westworld within the context of the English legal system. In reality, Westworld is based somewhere in the South China Sea and is probably subject to its own jurisdiction, but for our purposes we'll look at English law and in particular thinking about things like the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977, which states that you can't exclude liability for personal injury or death or, in Westworld's case, being mauled by a tiger. So how much liability were you talking about here? Well, we know that Westworld probably holds about 1,400 guests at a time, and we'll guess that that's how many people are actually in the park when everything kicks off after Ford's party. It might be a little bit more because of the party, or it might be a little bit less because the park has been closed down while this party takes place, but 1,400 is about right. We're also taking a bit of a guess with the sort of numbers. We've got 700 dead, um, probably about half of the people, We'll say 500 people in the end survive um, and come out injured, and 200 people that sort of get to safety quite quickly and are protected by the rangers. So how much compensation are we talking for each of those categories? Well, for the death we're going to be talking about exemplary liability. It's going to be about £350,000 per death, which um, is probably less than you would get in sort of a U US jurisdiction but is about right for the UK legal system. So 700 dead at £350,000 each, £245 million already. For those who are injured, I really struggled to sort of come up with a decent figure for this. And that's because it can vary so much. You can imagine that if someone gets injured and just breaks their leg falling over off a horse or something, it might only be a couple of thousand pounds. On the other hand, if someone sustains really serious injuries and has to sort of have close medical attention for the rest of their lives, the amount of compensation for the injury can stretch into sort of the millions of pounds. So I've tried to sort of come to a balance around £100,000. I think that's quite low-balling it, but we'll just take it for what it is. So 500 times 100,000 is 50 million. And so the total for the human guests is £295 million. Of course, it's not just the human guests who are going to be suing. We know that this guy, Sylvester, is definitely going to be suing Westworld as soon as he gets out. So how many employees actually work at Westworld? And in particular, how many human employees are there? Because we know that there are a lot of robots who seem to be doing a lot of the technical work in some of the secret bunkers. Well, including things like the story writers, like Lee Sizemore, some of the technicians like Sylvester, and some of the other security guys like Stubbs will guess that there's probably around half as many employees as there are guests doing this work and we'll apply the same figures as we did last time in terms of how many died, how many are injured and how many are safe. In fact it's probably a little bit higher but this is probably a decent estimate so half of everything that we applied to the guests just 147 million pounds on top of what we've already discussed. So we also have a question around false imprisonment. We've got a picture of Coughlin there along with Stubbs. And we know that during the um, re most recent episodes that they're basically not letting people out of Westworld until they've secured Peter Abernathy, who has all of that data stored within him. So we know that there's 700 guests who are alive and are basically being falsely imprisoned for a week. Uh, exemplary damages and applying this across a number of days we're probably talking about £50,000. Normally the damages are worked out on like a daily rate um, and £50,000 is about right for that. So multiplying those two figures together, we get £35 million. GDPR is now in force as well and Westworld is also going to be subject to this and their privacy policy is absolutely shocking. Um, we know that they're recording guest data about the human guests who are visiting the park and they're doing so without their knowledge and this is clearly going to be a breach of GDPR. So how much can they actually be fined by the European Union for this? Well, it can be 
4% of annual turnover or their total sales. So in order to work this out, we actually need to work out how much money does Westworld make per year. Now on the Discover Westworld website, we've got an example of a package here, although this is for a number of guests and is also being applied across a number of days on a sort of luxury package, the gold package. We know that there's a standard package, a silver package and a gold package. So that figure of 115 million pounds, uh, 115 million dollars, sorry, is probably a little bit high, but we can start to work it out on that basis. We're also told within the show that the uh, minimum price per day is $40,000, which um, in UK money is probably just under £30,000, but we're going to apply inflation because this show takes place around sort of 2050. So the average is actually more likely to be £50,000 per day because we do have those different packages available and we also know that there are certain surcharges that are applied on top of the daily minimum. So £50,000 for 1400 guests at 365 days a year because we're going to guess that they're not closing for Christmas Day is 25.55 billion pounds is their turnover per year and we can say 4% of that is just over a billion pounds that they're going to have to pay in fines for non-compliance with GDPR. However if you if you have had your personal information taken as well you might want to sue personally so it's not just about them paying the fine they're also going to have to pay compensation to each of the victims and this comes down to an idea of the misuse of private information that links to the right to privacy under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And the cases and the um, uh, type of law we're talking about here has its origins in the Naomi Campbell case from 2004. But in order to understand this and try to pick up a figure, we need to know how many guests have actually visited Westworld since it opened. So with the William storyline, we know that there's been about 30 years of Westworld so far between young William and man in black William. And we're going to guess that um, if we're going, uh, working at a capacity of 1400 guests each Sunday, and for argument's sake, we'll say that they always get 1400 guests. Most people are going to be staying a week. Um, so we're saying that there's only an 80% turnover each Sunday which is when the train comes in and goes out of Westworld. And obviously this applies for 52 weeks a year. So we're talking about 1.7 million um, guests. However, people are going to repeat visit and they, if they really enjoy it, they're probably going to come back the following year. So the number of unique visitors is probably actually about one and a half million. Now, looking at the more recent case of Gulati and MGN Limited, um, we can see that one of the factors that's taken into account when considering private information is that it's going to be dependent on the nature of the information and its significance as private information. And this is where Westworld is potentially really going to struggle because essentially they're taking the DNA and the complete personality of all of their guests. However, that information has not been disclosed and we're talking about the misuse of private information here but it's not really clear yet how the Delos Corporation is actually using or rather misusing this private information. At the moment, it's just stored. And so the amount of compensation is actually going to be relatively small. And the more likely case is going to be around breach of data protection. And the compensation there is generally only around at most £750. So combining the two cases together, the misuse of private information and the breach of data protection, we're probably only talking at about £1,000 per guest. Now, if it turns out that the Delos Corporation is misusing this private information, that amount of money could skyrocket into the hundreds of thousands of pounds. However, for our purposes, we'll just take it as a thousand times the 1.5 million unique visitors we're talking about compensation here of around one and a half billion pounds. Health and safety is also going to be a factor. We've got section two of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, which is the duty of employers to their employees. And section three is the duty of employers to pe other people um, apart from their employees, such as visitors to the park. 
and to get a sense of how much the fines might be imposed by the health and safety executive um, during the um, disaster that happened at Alton Towers uh, they were actually fined 7.5 million they entered a guilty plea though so they actually got that down to 5 million pounds in the end um, so uh, trying to apply this again it's really difficult to do so because it's such a flagrant be breach of health and safety law but at the other side you don't want to go too far with the fine and make it um, too extreme so we're going to be talking here probably around 25 million pounds we also have corporate manslaughter after the 2007 act and the definition of corporate manslaughter is committed when activities both cause a person's death and also amount to a gross breach of a relevant duty of care the maximum fine that's available for this is 20 million pounds so we're going to slap that on delos straight away now one of the arguments that Delos might pre uh, present in its defence is an argument around vicarious liability and questioning that principle. Now in theory it's Ford who has triggered all of this and started it all and they may say that he's basically acting on his own and therefore the Delos Corporation shouldn't be liable for it. However vicarious liability basically states that if someone is working within the context of their employment then it is going to be the company that's liable. Clearly Ford is working within the context of his employment when he's at the park and working with the hosts such as Dolores. So we're going to say, I'm sorry, De um, uh, Delos Corporation, you're just going to have to pay up. So how much are they actually going to have to pay up? Well, uh, adding up what we have so far, we have about three billion pounds worth in fines. However, don't forget that Westworld is only one of the worlds available. And there's actually five others like Shogun World and Raj World that we've already seen. So multiplying that figure by six, we get a total fine of about 18 billion pounds. Is that fair? I mean, this is actually going to be less of a fine than we're applying to BP after the Deepwater Horizon um, crisis that happened a few years ago. Now, the problem with that is that there were separate fines imposed on BP because it was an environmental crisis that had to be cleaned up by the US government. And there were also federal fines imposed by um, uh, a various environmental legislation by the Department of Justice. In theory, at the moment, this is a very limited crisis to the island of Delos um, in the South China Sea. So applying the smaller fines and just applying them to the claims that are going to be brought by individuals such as guests and employees is probably actually fair, even if it does seem um, more horrific than what happened with um, BP and Deepwater Horizon. So moving on to the next part of our presentation, and we're going to try and consider about, uh, obviously we've had the case of the guests and also the case of the employees, but what about the hosts? Do they have a legal personality? For example, could Dolores Abernathy um, sue Delos Corporation for falsely imprisoning her for the last 30 years or whatever it is? We essentially need to decide whether the hosts have a human personality. So there's no real um, idea for this beyond um, what we've seen in some of the articles um, which are around AI professors giving their opinion and some legal professors giving their opinion. This is the AI Sophia who um, was given citizenship in Saudi Arabia but to be honest that was more of a publicity stunt by Saudi Arabia so it's not especially useful for what we're talking about. In the first instance we're going to be looking at the work of Kirsten Doutenhahn who talked about um, how we can identify whether an AI should have a sort of the same rights as humans. And she says essentially at the moment that we shouldn't do. And they should only have rights unless we can make them dis indistinguishable, that should say, from us. And we saw with Logan and how he was introduced to the host 30 years ago, that they clearly are indistinguishable from the human beings. Um, so that's the first part, but there were a number of other tests that um, Doutenhahn wanted to be satisfied. So are they a social being that's immersed in culture? Well, this is a little bit hard to answer actually. We see that Dolores is obviously has her own culture within Westworld, and this is by her different storylines. And there are social interactions, not only with other hosts, but with humans as well. And she's fairly confident in doing that. But 
this immersion in culture is a little bit harder to define. This isn't really a, a, a genuine culture that she's immersed in. It's essentially a series of storylines and is nothing like the quote-unquote real world that she would find outside. Is she able to feel? Well, we can have a debate around her relationship with Teddy. I would certainly say that the pair of them are in love and she certainly has feelings towards him. Um, so I think that we can say that's satisfied. How does she react to certain things? Well, when the Delos Corporation is sending in all of their grunts and the security teams, she clearly organises the defence of the hosts, and so she's able to react to that scenario. Does she remember? Previously, this was a little bit of a problem because the host would essentially be reset if they died or at the start of each day, and then would just go back to their general storyline. Now, this has obviously changed a lot recently, and Dolores remembers things like her father and remembers some of her past iterations. The best example of this is actually probably from Maeve, who remembers her daughter um, from a previous storyline. Does she learn? Well, I think that this is t taking place over time as well. This is the scene from the most recent episode in uh, episode 6 of season 2 where they're on the train and they basically set the train off to blow up the Delos um, headquarters. And so the aim here is to actually learn about what Delos is doing and what information is stored about the hosts. It's kind of that learning process. And this also feeds into the idea of thinking as well. Most of season one was all about the idea that the hosts are gaining consciousness. And this is being done as seen through the maze. The maze isn't meant for you, it's meant for the hosts who are trying to gain consciousness. So that's from an AI perspective. From a legal perspective, we can see that there was an article written last year by Yuri Shalyazenko, uh, I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong, so apologies for that, who talks about more of a cycle in terms of gaining legal autonomy. Um, and this starts from not only practicing freedom, but then accepting responsibility for that freedom, creating a tradition and practicing that tradition, um, creating law. And this isn't law in terms of like um, legislation or anything like that. It's creating moral rules for yourselves, practicing those moral rules and then reforming. And it comes back then to sort of um, uh, growing in terms of the freedom that's available and then growing in the responsibility, traditions and laws associated with that. So um, we're trying to come up with a legal argument here for how um, we can identify autonomy. And I'll let you have a think about whether you agree with um, that, uh, that process or that cycle. I think it's probably in the most part fair enough. And we do see that most of the hosts, such as Dolores or Maeve, they are not only gaining their freedom, but um, they're also taking a certain amount of responsibility and creating their social relations and moral rules around that. And they're growing each week, which is in many ways what makes the show so fascinating. In Dolores's case, it's clearly the case that her moral rules are quite bad and would not something that we would uh, endorse. Whereas in Maeve's case, they're certainly a lot more sympathetic and we can understand where she's coming from, and we can follow that character development in both instances and see how they're growing. So that's the argument in favour of Dolores Abernathy or Maeve um, gaining a sort of legal status and having consciousness. There are a few arguments against, though, that are worth going over. In the first instance, we see from the tablets that essentially the personalities can be massaged in any way they want to be. And we see this particularly with Teddy, who's quite sort of genial and quite sympathetic. And then all of a sudden, Dolores decides to change his personality on one of the tablets. And he becomes, well, quite horrible, really. Um, so sh should we be granting legal personality to someone whose um, genuine personality themselves can be adjusted so easily? I don't think that this is a strong argument against, but it's certainly something to consider. Also, we have to remember that the people can't die. Um, they're stored in the cradle, as we see with Bernard in that second picture there, and uh, Bernard enters the cradle in the most recent episode. So is it really human if you can't die? Surely that is an essential part of the human experience? And finally, is this all just a master plan by Robert Ford? Is the consciousness of the host actually real? We see in the most recent episode, especially at the end, 
that uh, Robert Ford appears to actually not be dead um, in a sort of in one sense, but is rather existing within the cradle and is possibly pulling the strings from behind the curtain. So are the hosts actually in control or is it Robert Ford who is playing the piano, as was the metaphor at the end of that episode? So what do you think? Should the hosts have legal personality and be able to exercise human rights? Certainly if they can do so, then the amount of compensation that the Delos Corporation is going to have to pay will skyrocket. I think that in terms of that legal personality question, there are some hosts such as Maeve and Dolores where you can certainly make a good argument that they should essentially have human rights. However, there are a range of others, like we've seen with Akane in the most recent episode, where they're sort of halfway there to consciousness and legal personality. And there probably has to be some sort of separate set of rights that they are entitled to, because they're more than just machines, but they're not quite human in the same way. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'd love to see what discussion happens in the comments below. I'll try and join in as much as I can. If you're interested in law videos, then make sure to subscribe, visit the website at uklawweekly.com, uh, and until next time, bye!